to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the apostle paul said as many of us as were baptized into christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. Friend, the Bible clearly teaches that baptism is essential to salvation, but oftentimes we hear objections to baptism being essential to salvation. This is the second part of our series on the objections to baptism. We encourage you to get your Bible and stay tuned as we study this subject together. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855. 458-3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In Acts chapter 2, verse number 38, the apostle Peter stood up with the eleven and proclaiming the gospel. Men and women had just asked, What must we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer was this, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter clearly taught, that in order to be saved from the sin of killing their own Messiah, they had to be baptized for the remission of sins. And yes, the Scriptures clearly teach, not just in one verse, but in a multitude of verses, that baptism is essential to salvation. Today we want to address a sixth objection that we have concerning baptism. Sometimes I hear people say, based on Acts 2.38, they'll say, well, the word for there could mean because of. And thus Peter is saying, I want you to repent and be baptized because your sins are forgiven. Now friend, that just doesn't make good contextual sense, first of all. Let me illustrate. These Jews who have the blood of Christ on their hands and now realize they've killed the Messiah, the Bible says they're cut to the heart. And they cry out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? We know we're in sin. We know we're lost. What you've said is right. We need God's grace and forgiveness. What do we need to do? Don't do anything. Repent and be baptized because your sins are already forgiven. What? That doesn't make any sense according to the context. They realize they're lost. And thus Peter told them what to do to be saved, not because they were already saved. How could they be saved? This is the first time they, anybody's ever heard the gospel. How could you be saved without first hearing the gospel? And this is the first time it's ever been preached. And so there's no doubt, according to the context, this just doesn't make good contextual sense. Secondly, this type of wording just doesn't make good sense in our language today either. Let me illustrate. Let's say that somebody says, 
I want you to eat. You need to eat for the nourishment of your body. Now, friend, are you going to walk away and say, oh, I know what he means. I need to eat because my body's already nourished. Well, of course not. We might say, you need to breathe to bring oxygen into your cells. Are you going to walk away and say, oh, I know what he means. I'm going to breathe because my cells are already oxygenated. Well, of course not. We understand that the word for means in order to receive something. I'm going to eat for my body to be nourished, in order that my body might be nourished. I'm going to breathe in order that my blood cells will receive oxygen. It's not because of. We don't use that type of thinking in everyday language. But you know, the, the strongest argument to help us see this is a false teaching and a false argument is based on another teaching in the New Testament. Now, friend, let me ask you this. If we were going to convince someone that the word for in Acts 2 verse 38 does not mean because of, the best way we could do that is to show them the same Greek syntax for their mission of sins used in another passage and what it means. Wouldn't you agree that'd be a pretty good way to understand that? Well, let's do exactly that. Same Greek syntax for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38, found in Matthew 26, 28. Now I want you to think about this. Ask yourself as you hear Matthew 26, 28, does this mean because of? Here's what Jesus said. As he took the fruit of the vine, Jesus said, this is my blood of the new covenant shed, here's that exact same syntax, for the remission of sins. Now is anybody anywhere going to say that word for means because of? Are we going to say Jesus went to, he suffered, he came to this earth, he suffered, he died on the cross, his blood was shed because men are already forgiven? Well, of course not. That'd be, that'd be ludicrous. People would be up in arms if anybody tried to teach that about Christianity. And yet that same Greek structure for the remission of sins is used in Acts 2.38. And friend, it means the exact same thing. Why did Jesus die on the cross? In order that for men to have remission of sins. Why are men baptized? For the remission of sins in order that their sins might be washed away. Now friend, are we saying you're earning salvation? Don't even think that. We're not even saying that at all. When I'm baptized, can I look up to heaven and say, God, you owe me salvation? Of course not. Salvation's the free gift of God. But realize this, salvation is by grace through faith. Ephesians 2 verse 8, I must meet the conditions of God to be, salva to be saved. Is belief a condition? You bet it is. Jesus said, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord's going to heaven, but he who does, the will of my Father. I've got to believe. That's a condition. I've got to repent. That's a condition. I've got to confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's a condition. But are any of those conditions earning salvation? No. But they're things I've got to do. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Must we obey Christ to go to heaven? Absolutely. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. And so the idea that this fits uh, Matthew, the Acts 2 verse 38 means because of, friend, it's not, not good thinking according to uh, common sense, the way we talk today. It's not correct according to the context and the Greek syntax of an identical structure. And Matthew 26, 28 shows that's not what that phraseology in the Scripture means. And so when we let the Bible define its own terms, we can know exactly what that means. Another objection that we often hear as it relates to baptism is this. Sometimes people will say, well, I see what you're saying about these passages, maybe in Acts or some of the other books, but... The Apostle Paul, who we realize wrote much of the New Testament, half if not more, uh, Paul didn't preach baptism in any of his gospel presentations. And thus people will say, you know, Paul didn't say you've got to be baptized, so therefore you don't have to. Wait a minute. Paul specifically said that one had to be baptized to get into Christ where salvation is. Would you direct your attention to Romans chapter 6? And I want you to notice what Paul did say about the essentiality of baptism. Now, friend, I want you to be thinking about this because it, it validates, it validates the fact 
that baptism is essential to salvation. Can you be saved without the blood of Christ? Of course not. We all realize Jesus' blood is essential to salvation. Where do I contact the blood of Jesus? Let's let Paul tell us. Under inspiration, Paul said in Romans 6, beginning in verse number 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not, or God forbid. Now watch this. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, watch this, were baptized into His death. Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. There are two extremely important things in that context that we want you to notice. First, the Apostle Paul clearly said, we are baptized into Christ. Now friend, how important is that? Here's how important it is. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 10 says, Salvation's in Christ. Ephesians 1.3 says, All spiritual blessings are in Christ. If salvation's there and all spiritual blessings are there, then friend, I want to know, I've got to know, how do I get into Christ where salvation is? We're baptized into Christ. The Bible also says, and Paul also taught, that we contact the death of Christ by baptism. We're buried with Him in baptism, into His death. Friend, is the death of Jesus essential to salvation? Well, everybody recognizes it is. Jesus tasted death for all men. Hebrews 2 verse 9. He overcame death by His death. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. We can have victory because Jesus died for our sins. And so everybody's going to realize the death of Christ is essential to salvation. Where do I contact that death and blood? We're buried with Him in baptism into His death. Friend, Paul absolutely taught that baptism is the point at which I get into Christ and that baptism is the point at which I contact the death of Jesus and both of those are essential to salvation. And so, yes, Paul did preach in teaching the gospel that one must be baptized to be saved. Another objection that often comes up as we think about the teaching of baptism in the New Testament. Let's say that we're teaching on baptism and we say, Jesus said you've got to be baptized. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 16. And we, we bring up 1 Peter 3, 21. Baptism does now also save us. Many times people will say, but Peter said in Acts 2, verse 21, whoever calls on the name of the Lord to be saved, and thus all you've got to do to be saved is call on the name of the Lord. Now friend, that passage never says that's all you've got to do. In fact, we've got to put the totality of what God says together to get the full message. Wouldn't you agree? It's not as though I can just flip in the Bible and turn one page out and say, here's what the Bible says and I can just take that and exclude everything else. I've got to put everything together. Psalm 119. The Bible says in verse 160, the sum of God's Word is truth. What's a sum? It's the totality. It's when you add everything together. The sum, the product, everything added together, the totality of it's truth. But friend, you know what's even more important as it relates to Acts 2.21? Please understand, we recognize that passage clearly teaches you've got to, whoever calls the name of the Lord to be saved. There's no denying that. The Bible teaches that. We absolutely believe that. But friend, let's let the Bible again be its own best commentary. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? May I direct your attention to Acts chapter 22, verse number 16. Let's let the Holy Spirit tell us how to call on the name of the Lord scripturally. Acts 22, 16, Ananias comes to Saul, who was told, you go in the city, be told you what you must do. Ananias now comes with that essential fact, and he says, and now to Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Don't miss this. Calling on the name of the Lord. How do you call on the name of the Lord? You get up and do what God says to be saved, which includes being baptized to have your sins washed away. Friend, if we'll let God tell us what it means, if we'll let the Bible, instead of listening to men, 
Instead of listening to commentaries, instead of letting people's ideas or opinions make us biased toward this, if when it comes to a phrase or when it comes to some teaching in the Bible, if I'll get out my concordance or if I'll get out a dictionary and look that phrase up and search the other scriptures, and if I let the Bible define its own terms, we can understand what God meant for that to be. And so, what did God mean? When he said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord be saved. Multitudes of false teachers have said, all that means is you've got to look up into heaven and say, I believe in Jesus, come into my heart and save me. You know what? The Bible doesn't define it that way. How does the Bible define whoever calls the name of the Lord be saved? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, having called on the name of the Lord. You complete the action of calling on the name of the Lord by getting up and being baptized to have your sins washed away. And so the scripture does not teach that all you've got to do is call on the name of the Lord, meaning all you've got to do is believe in Jesus or mouth the words, I believe in Christ. There's more to it than that as we see from the scripture in the teaching of the New Testament. Then I hear another objection as it relates to the Bible's teaching on the plan of salvation. And sometimes I hear people say, well, you know, I've heard these verses that you said. I've seen what the Scripture teaches. We've read these together tonight. Uh, but what about the sinner's prayer? I was always taught that the sinner's prayer saves. And by the sinner's prayer, they mean something like this. Billy Graham and Franklin Graham and a host of other Baptist preachers and other religious beliefs have gone around the nation teaching. All you've got to do to be saved is say the sinner's prayer. Just say it with me. Lord Jesus, I accept you into my heart now. I recognize you as Lord and Savior. Please save me. Some prayer similar to that is what they'll tell you to say. Now, first and foremost... Realize this, and I want you to listen real carefully. The sinner's prayer, as these false teachers have gone around the nation and the world and taught, is found nowhere in the Bible. That's right. You can search your Bible from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation chapter 22, verse 21, and you will never find that sinner's prayer a multitude of false teachers are telling people to do to be saved. Why are they doing that? I don't know. But it's not in the Bible. It must make people feel good. Maybe it does, but it's not in the Scripture. And so you don't find the sinner's prayer anywhere in the Bible. Now, I was preaching on this subject one time in a gospel meeting uh, endeavor, or an evangelistic opportunity, and we were talking about this, and I mentioned this very idea, that the sinner's prayer is found nowhere in the Bible. Well, right after that lesson, uh, a lady made a beeline to me, and she came up to me, and she said, she said, Preacher, she said, I heard what you said about the sinner's prayer not being the Bible. She said, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to ask my pastor if that's true. And I said, well, that'd be great. I said, you go home and ask him. And whatever verses he gives you to show the sinner's prayer, as we've mentioned tonight, you bring those back and show me. Well, next night the gospel meeting begins. Right before it starts, she makes a beeline to me again, and she says these words. She said, preacher, she said, I went home, and I asked my preacher, my pastor, if the sinner's prayer was in the Bible, like you had said, and he said it wasn't. And I told him he's a liar. Friend, I want you to think about that a moment. This lady had been told probably all her life, the sinner's prayer, what you've got to do to be saved. She probably somehow connected that. Here's a religious person who believes in the Bible telling me the sinner's prayer is saved. She probably somehow connected that with a belief that it's in the Bible. And all that time she'd been taught that and challenged on it. And that preacher had to say, not anywhere in the Bible. Thank God she said he was a liar. That's right. People who teach the sinner's prayer saves are not telling the truth. Now, friend, let me show you an example. If the sinner's prayer would have ever saved anybody, it would have saved this man. Saul was told, you go in the city, be told you what you must do. And my friend, Saul no doubt prayed a many of prayers as a sinner. Listen to Acts chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. So the Lord said to Ananias, Arise, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Watch this now. For behold, he is praying. And in a vision he's seen a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. Is it the case that Saul of Tarsus, who was blinded and confronted by Jesus, was praying? There's no doubt he was. Did he recognize he's a sinner? Christ had clearly identified himself to him. There's no getting around that. Everything he'd done was contrary to what was true. And so he was praying. But did that sinner pray 
save him at that point? Absolutely not. Ananias came to Saul. When we get the rest of the story in Acts 22, 16, Ananias came and said, Why are you waiting? You've been praying already. Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Friend, let's address another objection that often comes up as we think about the essentiality of baptism. Sometimes I'll hear people say, With what you're teaching, seems like you're saying we're saved by baptism. And the Bible teaches we're saved by Jesus' blood, not baptism. Now friend, there's no doubt. The blood of Christ is that saving agent that washes away, that cleanses man's sin. Ephesians 1, 7, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Revelation 1, verse 5, We're washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so there's no doubt. The blood of Jesus is that saving agent, His sacrifice. We're talking about blood. We're not talking about the red substance. We're talking about the sacrifice. The blood of Christ represents the totality of His sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so a man giving up his life for us, that perfect one, made salvation available. But friend, do we not realize that one cannot contact the blood of Jesus without being baptized. In fact, the Scripture teaches the blood of Jesus that saves us is contacted in baptism. So we're not saying these are opposed, these are diametrically opposed. You're saying baptism saves, the Bible says blood of Christ saves. These are not diametrically opposed. opposed. These beautifully go hand in hand. The Bible says in Romans 6, verse number 3, that we're buried with Christ into baptism where we contact His death. It's the blood, it's the death, it's the sacrifice of Jesus that saves. When do I contact that? When I'm baptized into His death. Listen again. Now friend, if I can know the blood of Jesus saves, and I can know the death of Jesus saves, then friend, that moment in time when God says I'm saved, when my sins have been washed away, I can know whatever moment in time and whatever happened was essential to be saved. Would you agree with that? Think about Acts 22, 16 again. Ananias told Saul, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. If the blood of Christ saves, if the death of Jesus is what cleanses sin, what point do I reach that death? Arise, be baptized, wash away your sins. If the Bible teaches, and it does, Baptism is the point in time when sins are washed away. Then, friend, baptism and the blood of Christ go hand in hand. That's the way God set it up. This is not men's idea. They're not men's teaching. That's not what men say. We've quoted to you today from the Bible. We've shown from the Scripture. That's what God says. And, friend, while there are a host of people teaching otherwise, all that matters for each one of us today is that we simply submit to God and do what He says to be saved. It doesn't matter what some preacher somewhere says. It doesn't matter what some religious book somewhere says or some commentary says. What matters is, is there any word from the Lord? Now friend, oftentimes with the truth of these things being as they are, with the Bible teaching on baptism being so clear and so plain, we sometimes will hear what we deem as a rather emotional argument. And well, we can understand this to some extent, but it doesn't change what the Scripture says. Here's the objection that I hear as it relates to the emotional side. Someone will say, you're right, that, you know, that's what the Bible teaches. Mark 16, 16 clearly says, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Uh, there's no doubt Peter said, repent and be baptized, and that means for the remission of sins. But if I do that, if I do what you're saying, That'll contemn my whole family to hell. Friend, listen carefully. There is nothing you can do that will condemn your family who's already gone on to hell. Your actions or inactions are not going to affect their eternal destiny. While they were here and while they were alive, we might have had an opportunity to read it. When they've passed from this life, you're not going to save or condemn anybody by your actions or inactions. Here's the principle. Romans 14, 12 says, So then, each of us shall give an account of himself to God. I'm going to give an account for me. 
For what I know and for what I do, that's what I'm going to give an account of. If I learn what the Bible teaches about baptism, if I learn the truth on this subject, if mama or grandma or daddy or my sister or brother didn't know that and they've gone on, then there's nothing you can do or there's no action or inaction that could save or affect them, condemn them in any way. What you do now is important though. You can have an effect on your eternal destiny. And friend, I promise you this. If someone, let's just say it's the case that someone you know or someone I know didn't learn what the Scripture teaches on the, the subject of baptism. Let's say that we learn that and we want to obey God and we want to do the right thing. Friend, I promise you this. The one thing your family wants you to do is to obey God. How do I know that? Listen to Luke chapter 16. And I want you to listen to what uh, the rich man says here. He says in Luke chapter 16, <clears throat> verse number 28. He's already on the other side now, but listen to what his motive and heart is. He says, Father Abraham, he said, I beg you to, uh, verse 28, Verse 27, then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. What did the rich man who was already in hell want? He wanted just one person to go back and tell his family, do what's right and don't come here. Friend, I'll assure you, if someone in your family didn't obey God's teaching, there's nothing you can do to condemn them or save them. But I'll promise you this, though based on Luke 16, verse 27 and 28, the one thing they want you to do is learn the truth and obey God. More than anything, they want you to go to heaven. And so, friend, we've thought about a multitude of objections today. Those objections don't stand up to the test of Scripture. Maybe someone taught you baptism wasn't essential to salvation. Friend, we're begging you today. We love you. God loves you. We're begging you in view of what the Scriptures teach on this subject. Obey the Gospel. Become a Christian. Hear the Word of God. Believe that Jesus is God's Son. Repent of those things in your life that are not right. Confess the beautiful name of Jesus before men. And as the Bible says, be baptized for the remission of your sins to be saved. Our hope and prayer today is that you'll do just that because that's what God wants us to do. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.